Uh, I'm here with Lynn Coffin, who has been described as uh, one of the most prolific authors that you've never heard of. And we're trying to change that. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's probably uh, a fact that um, when people get to a certain age, they're, um, maybe their um, uh, uh, productivity starts to taper off, but it seems like you're going in reverse. And I think what, I don't know how many books are coming out just this year uh, that have your hand on it. Um, and recent books. Right, two more plus the Spanish translation. <laughs> and um, on the shelf be behind you, I can see uh, The Night in the Panther Skin. And uh, recently you were in um, England and you were um, uh, doing some reading at the Bodleian uh, Library. And um, one of the questions they asked you was, you know, what hooked you or what got you inspired? to write that book. There was a moment, I guess, that just you caught the flash of inspiration about the work. And I think it was ob uh, obviously had something to do with uh, the, the original author. So maybe you could share that story. Sure, I'd be glad to. First of all, I want to say one of the reasons that I think my productivity and my, my creativity maybe has been boosted recently has been because of you, Wolfram. You've been very helpful and supportive, <laughs> and I really appreciate that. And I've had several other people sort of rally around to try to get the word out. So I really want to thank them. Um, the Night in the Panther Skin, I was invited to come to Georgia, the country Georgia, in uh, 2005, I believe, by Professor Gia Jokadze, who had read about my book uh, called uh, Joseph Brodsky was Joseph Brodsky. I was uh, Joseph Brodsky's assistant for two years when he was in Ann Arbor. And Brodsky's a very, very prominent figure in European intellectual thought. Anyway, so Gia wrote me because he'd seen a copy of that book and he asked me questions about Brodsky and then he found out I was interested in translation. He sent me a couple of poems on email to translate. I did using his uh, interlinear works and he said it was the best that had ever been done. He had to bring me to Georgia. So we went ahead and he succeeded in getting some, a group of businessmen to fund me. And I came to Georgia not knowing a single person or even where I was going to be staying in Georgia or anything. It was a real stick, go out there moment. And so when we were, we decided to put together a collection of Georgian poetry, an anthology of Georgian poetry, which was eventually published by Slavica. And uh, Gia, I asked Gia how we should begin this anthology. And he said, we have to begin with Shota Rustavelli. And I said, who was Shota Rustavelli? I'd heard of some Georgian writers, but not him. And he said he was a 12th century monk. And I said, oh God, let's not begin our anthology with that. It's going to bore everyone to tears. And he said, I don't think anybody's going to be bored by Shota Rustavelli. And so he began to read a little of the Night in the Panther Skin in Georgian. And I was first captivated by the sound of the language. It's it's a beautiful epic poem, and it's done in Shiari, which is an ancient Persian poetic form, which is 16 syllable lines rhymed A, 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 B, 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 B. So I was captured by the music of it. And then he started to tell me a little of the story, and I started to try to work out the lines for myself with my rudimentary knowledge of Georgian. I was very excited when I recognized Mepe, meaning king. And so I said, oh, this is great. And then I looked to see about previous translations. And there were three English translations, but the latest one had been 40 years prior and it was in prose. And I wanted to do the poem in poetic form, in Rustavelli's form. And uh, so it became kind of a life dream of mine. And I told this to a poet friend and not recognizing what a small country Georgia is, he told that to a friend of his, Nato al Hazashvili. And he said, do you know any publishers who would be interested in this? Because I know Lynn, I think she can do it. And uh, Nato said, no, but I'll become a publisher. So she became a publisher so she could publish my work on Rustavelli. And she even gave me an advance, which was wonderful, um, mainly because it showed her confidence that I would do this. And it took me uh, more than two and a half years, almost three years, working intensively with a Georgian 
Dedona Kaziria, who is a scholar at Indiana. So that was the story, but it was the music first and then the story and then the feeling that there was no translation that did anything like justice to the original. Those three things. That's really great. And you did reveal a little bit, um, you know, this, uh, the challenge of translating a epic work from another language that, as you said, you had a rudimentary knowledge of. I'm sure you have significantly more knowledge at this point after translating it, but one of the distinctions I think you make is that there have been academic translations of this work, but they were not in poetic form. And that is a unique aspect that you approach this work, not as an academic and, and doing a word for word translation, but as another poet and to translate the essence of the poetry into English, which I, I can't even imagine how challenging that is. Um, Challenging is another word for inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing I want to say about that, it's not academic. On the other hand, I was very pleased that Donald Rayfield, who is the, sort of the authority in English Georgian translation, he uh, said that I had accomplished the impossible because not only had I translated it into poetry, into the same form, but that my translation, thanks to the Georgians with whom I worked, had unprecedented accuracy. So it's, it's a, not an academic translation, but it's also not a free translation. It very much cleaves to the original in its meaning and its form. Well, that's, that's really uh, fascinating. And this isn't the, uh, the first or the last translation you've done, correct? Correct. I have done many translations. The, the one I will mention that I did before that was of a Czech poet named Yuzi Orten, which was years ago and uh, was published by the University of Michigan Slavic Department. It was called Elegies. And Yuzi Orten was a Czech Jew uh, who was living in Prague during the Holocaust, unlike his brother, with whom he was very close, who had gone to England and uh, was on the broadcast team for the BBC. And Yuzi Orten was killed when he was 22 years old by a Gestapo ambulance. And yet his poems are truly great. They rank among the greatest of world literature. And I was really fortunate, again, to work with native speakers and to translate these into poetic form. And then I got feeling a little doubtful whether I had the right to do this because I didn't know Czech very well either. I, I learned as I went along, as you said, but I still, I was not a, by any means an expert in Czech. And then one day out of the blue, I got a letter from Yezi Orten's brother who described this amazing moment in his life where he's walking through used bookstores, not knowing of my translation, completely separate, and found a translation of his brother's work in English, took it home, and he wrote me a letter saying, I can now die a happy man. These are the poems my brother would have written if he'd written in English. And this from somebody who knew English as well as Czech. So it was like the universe telling me, go ahead. And as far as future translations, the only one now that I'm sure of that's been done and will be published in the fall is a, a translation of Galaktion, another Georgian poet, a very difficult poet that I did with a group of young poets in Tbilisi, and that will be published by Poesia Press in the fall. Well, I mean, this is just really an amazing story to hear. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I find fascinating as well, one, I have to say, because as you know, I'm a social change agent and an artist, and it's often been hard for people to understand or for me to communicate why art and being an artist is relevant in social change. And I think part of it uh, speaks to what you're saying is that as an artist, the beauty of being an artist is that you can imagine yourself to be almost any character or to do anything. I like to think that artists are very powerful in that regard, that we're able to make leaps of faith or artistic, with our artistic vision or to have a vision and carry it through, even though um, you may not speak this language or that language. So that I find really fascinating. The other thing, the question I would pose to you though, is in um, that obviously you're an author of many of your own works as well, but the, uh, you know, I would think that as an academic translator, this work would be tedious uh that it's it's obviously um you you have to take it literally every 
line by line, what is it about being, what is it about the consciousness or the process of translating that you enjoy or that you, that, that drives you to keep doing these translations? What is this, that space, uh, that head space of translating others works and, and you're not embellishing it, but you're bringing it to life in another language. And I just find that fascinating. Right. Well, yeah, it fascinates me too. And of course, these things are mysteries. We can we sort of like uh, the we go around the circle and guess, but the circle sits at the, the center. The secret sits in the center and knows. So, I I can only say my experience is that I have to really love the work. If I really love the work, it becomes very well, almost easy because I feel I sort of like a. Well, I'm an actor as well as a writer, and it's very much like being an actor and inhabiting somebody else's script, the lines, the character. You have someone else's lines, but you feel them as yourself in that moment. And so I felt that with Orten and Rustavelli, certainly, and many others, Dato Barbacadze, a contemporary Georgian poet. Uh, there was only one time when I translated a work uh, that I didn't feel that way, and that was Yaroslav Seifert's The Plague Column. And ironically, this, my translation of his book became, was used by the Nobel Prize Committee in granting Seifert his prize. So I guess it was okay, it was an okay translation, but I didn't really feel the resonance. I, I wasn't in love <laughs> with Seifert, and so it was a little bit on the tedious side for me. Uh, the other things, even Rustavelli taking more than two and a half years every day, because it's 1,661 quatrains, so that's a lot of quatrains to translate. And one of the things that I did, which is sort of against the rule of translations, is you're supposed to know the whole thing, including the end. I don't believe that as a translator, because the author, I know as an author, they don't know the whole thing as they're writing. They don't know what's going to happen. They may even think they do, but by the time they get there, it's different than they imagined. So what I do is I translate unit by unit, and I never go ahead of where I am reading. So Rustavelli had, I don't know, 60 chapters, something like that, and I would read and translate one chapter. And one thing that really motivated me to continue was not knowing what was going to happen. Rustavelli has this wonderful narrative. He always ends. It's almost like a TV soap opera or something. It's always a big question hanging in the balance that you can't figure out what's going to happen. So that motivated me. And this feeling of that uh, Orten's brother articulated, that I felt as though we were kindred spirits. I felt as though uh, once in a while I would even finish a line for the check I was working with and she, because she couldn't finish it, but I could finish it. But how did I know that word? I didn't, it was a very difficult word, but I would sort of guess or intuit the word and she would say, yes, that's right. How did you know that? I, I don't know. So it's a, it's a real feeling of love. And to me, translation is not that different from original writing. You have a sort of mysterious thought or feeling or story idea in your head and you want to get it across, and you begin not really knowing how you're going to do it. It's like getting on a raft and then hoping you're going to get to the other side. And with translation, it's very similar, except it's someone else's words that are that inspiration, not your own idea. Well, that, that's, it's really interesting as you were talking. Uh, I'm, far from, uh, I'm far from being a Lynn Coffin a uh, scholar myself and really understanding like the, the, the zeitgeist of your total body of work. But one thing that stands out when you were talking is the sense of you when I'm reading your work, whether it's uh, one of your own original works or a translation, uh, or an original translation, of course, but I get this sense of being drawn into a very personal moment, a very personal conversation. Like as you were describing like, when you were translating that you weren't looking towards the end or having this big picture, perhaps academic view of the work that you're drawn into the moment where we're really where the artist or the writer is in that moment. It's sort of, it, it seems to be uh, a thread in your work. if, if I'm not mistaken. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I think it is that way. Uh, and I think uh, Rustavelli, I think of, you know, many, many moments, uh, for example, one moment that just you have to be part of is toward the end, Aftandil, who is uh, 
searching for the answer to where Tariel's girlfriend has been stashed. And he decides that he really should become intimate with this lusty married woman who's sort of like out of Canterbury Tales, pot mom. And so they begin to make love and suddenly this strange knight shows up in the doorway and he says to Potman, enjoy yourselves now because tomorrow I'm going to make you devour your children. I'm going to kill your children and make you eat them. And so that kind of dampens the mood a little bit. <laughs> and Afton uh, Dill says, who was that? And Potman says, I'll tell you, but before I tell you, could you please go and kill him? And that's like the ending of the chapter. So um, Avondale says, sure, okay, and he goes off and he finds the guy and he kills him and he brings him back and so forth. But Bustaville is full of those moments. And one other one that I really love is uh, my favorite character in Bustaville is Tariel, who is a knight, but he's not a knight like we think of King Arthur's knights, all stoical and Aryan and, I don't know, manly man, whatever. He's very much in touch with the emotional side, all Georgian knights are. So they cry a lot, a lot. And if like their friend is in trouble and they don't feel sad, they scratch their face until they cry or beat their head against a wall until they cry so that they can express commonality. And uh, Tariel is this great knight and uh, Aftendil uh, comes to find him in the cave uh, and uh, Tariel has promised to be there and he's not there. So he's given one promise. <laughs> this is a knight who gives a promise to his friend, his buddy, who's risking everything for him. And he doesn't follow through on the one promise, which is not a hard promise. Anyway, when Afendil finds him, he's almost dead and he's lying in the bushes and he's just killed a lion and a tiger. So you wonder, why did he kill the lion and the tiger? And then the chapter stops and then you find out why and so on. So there are these moments that just go on and on that are just magnificent. The narrative is, Unbelievable! It's like Beowulf, but with a with a, a turn page turner. And I never felt that way with Beowulf. Well, you you know uh, my mother uh, Sela Coffin, who shares you know shared obviously her same last name, was also a poet. Uh, she was the most unpublished uh, poet you've never heard of. <laughs> but one of her um, her big ideas in her work that I've carried on. Uh, that relates to this conversation is uh, her 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 interest in the magic of moments and places of rescue. And I wonder if you could highlight. Uh, you shared a couple of gruesome uh, moments there, but in in uh, the night in the panther skin, could you describe a moment? Uh, you know, just to be clarify, she was speaking of not necessarily physical places. But uh, sometimes they were physical, sometimes they weren't. But, they, but you know, she had many struggles in her life. And there were these moments, often poetic, uh, artistic, inspirational moments when she wrote, when she found the energy to write, um, that uh, she felt rescued right. in that moment. And I'm wondering if there's a moment like that, that you, that you, in, in the process of translation, where it was just a, a place of rescue or a moment of magic in the book where you might go to in your mind? Yes. Oh, that's a very good question. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I, I think I can respond. Uh, I think of a moment. So uh, when Aftendil is sent out to find uh, Tariel's story uh, and he can't find Tariel, finally he finds some people. Tariel has this habit of he wants to be by himself and people keep bothering him. And he keeps making it clear he doesn't want to be bothered and they don't pay attention. And so then he kills them, often with his whip. But anyway, <laughs> is tracking him down and he finally sees him. But he says to himself, you know, if I accost this knight myself, one of us is going to get killed and it's probably going to be me. So uh, let's not do that. So he tracks Tariel to a cave and finds out that he's there with his helpmate, with a servant, uh, Osman. So he waits until Tario leaves, and then he goes to the cave, and he says to Osman, he springs out of the bushes, and she's terrified, starts screaming for Tario, and he grabs her, and he says, don't be afraid, I'm not going to do anything to you, I just want you to tell me Tario's story. And Osman says, I can't do that. And then Aftendil loses his patience, he grabs her, gets out a knife, and says, okay, I'm going to kill you. And she says, okay, kill me, do you think I care? I, I reckon life is a bale of straw. 
and people who are headless do not usually tell tales. <laughs> so if you're expecting me to tell the story after you've cut off my head, that's a little naive. So then he gives up and then he starts crying like a good Georgian knight. He's weeping and he explains that he loves this woman. She sent him on this quest. What is he gonna do? He has to fulfill the quest. And Ozma starts crying and says, now that you've talked to me of your love, I, I love you too and I'm gonna help you. It's my life's duty now to help you. And she says, she takes all his, his horse, his armor, everything he's got and hides it in the cave, which is interesting. And then, and hides him too. And she says, just wait there and be quiet. And so Tariel comes back and Osmond says to him, you, you're hanging out with animals too much. You should have a buddy. You should, don't you miss male companionship? And Tariel says, yes, but who would I get? Who is as good as I am as a knight? She said, well, if I found a knight who was just as wonderful and heroic, Yes, says Terry, but he'd have to come here. Well, if I found this knight who would come here, would you promise not to kill him? <laughs> and Terry says, yes, I'd welcome his brother. She says, okay, Optendil, come on out. <laughs> so Optendil comes out and they embrace and they have this wonderful time together. So for me, that little scene that's like the rescue moment is uh, oftentimes, I mean, that scene is like two pages and it starts out with you want, you want something and it seems to often until he has the right to have the story he doesn't get it so then he gets mad and tries to force his will he doesn't get it even more then he gives up in his despair i'm not going to get it and suddenly providence or fate or god if you will or something takes a hand and gives it to him just gives him this thing so for me that's a real moment of rescue and and, and it's sort of a, a, a word to the wise, if you will, that, you know, you, I think that's happened in my life many times. I want something, I don't get it. I take some extreme will, force it, and I don't get it even more. Then I'm all in despair, I'm crying. And then something happens. I reconcile myself to the fact I'm not gonna get it. And then I get it. <laughs> so that's a kind of, I'm not sure if that's what your mom meant, but that's what I think of as a rescue moment. No, I think uh, she was really hoping to invoke for any of us to find those places ourselves and not define it as one, it, like she said in, in many of her poems, it was many different places inside her mind, inside a poem, inside a line, sometimes inside a word. Um, so it could be anywhere and that's the whole point of it. And that was a great analogy. Now, uh, Did you mention yeah. Line? I just want to mention another thing about Bruce Bell is really surprising, and there's a line in there that lions' whelps are equally lions, male or female though they be. He's writing this in the 12th century, and he's saying that male and female are equal. And this to me, I mean, it took us a long time, and we're still with the Me Too movement and so on, we're still coming to that realization. He had it firm in his head. So the very first chapter of The Night in the Panther Skin begins when a king who has no sons passes his kingdom on to his daughter. Does this sound like King Lear? Yeah, but this daughter is a wonderful ruler, just like Cordelia, and the king knows it, and the council knows it, and she rules the country, and it's a happy story. And this is out of Rustavelli's own life that he was in love with a woman who, the only female ruler of Georgia, and her name was King Tamar. They called her a king because she was so strong and was like a king. So they know that lions' whelps are equal, male or female, though they may be. Well, that's a, uh, that's a great story. And obviously a good, um, you've I've provided a few incentives for people to want to go and buy this book <laughs> and read a epic uh, Georgian poem from the 12th century. Um, so it is available on uh, Amazon.com. It's available, uh, obviously, here in the U.S. And it's also been uh, distributed in Georgia, I imagine, and all other countries. All over Georgia. It won the Saba Prize, which is, I don't know how you would like the Pulitzer Prize here, maybe. Um, and I was very glad of that because then it meant, uh, you know, a widespread access to it. And, and in England, there, there is a, there is a quite a, few places to get that as well. Great. And of course, uh, folks can go to your website, lynncoffin.com. There's a whole list of your books uh, there on the website. And you've also recently been adding some 
fun new um, you know, pieces of your work uh, specifically tailored for social media. Uh, some, uh, I believe you call them tweebles. Um, and uh, also you've been uh, participating in a Twitter phenomenon called the Six Word Story uh, and some other content there. So I encourage people to visit your website, lynncoffin.com. Right. And of course, uh, buy the book. That's the best thing you can do to support artists and authors today. Um, I, I did say Amazon.com, but of course, if you can order it or get it through your local brick and mortar bookstore and support, um, you know, bookstore, keep bookstores alive, please do that. But um, it is generally available. And um, uh, any uh, uh, plans to translate more Georgian works at this point? At this point, no. I mean, everything has been focused on uh, two things. Well, the the knight. I wanted to just say that the knight and the panther skin is also. I've started a new uh, campaign on Twitter and putting little sections of the knight and little aphorisms and lines from the knight on the panther skin. But um, right now, I'm focused. I have a novel coming out in the fall oh. called the Aftermath. It's published by Transcendent Zero Press in Texas. And I am busy uh, rereading, uh, proofreading, and uh, thinking about ways to improve it. And uh, that's the focus of my uh, attention right now. And after that, then I'll think about whether there are other Georgian. Well, that will be the subject of our next okay. online interview. So for now, I'm going to close the interview and again encourage folks to visit uh, lynncoffin.com and to uh, discover more of your work. So thank, thank you. you. Welcome. I really enjoyed talking with you today. All right. I'm going to I'm going to hang up now. <laughs> uh, nice to talk with you. All right. Bye bye.